about seven or eight years old. I was a real small young man, and I lived up in Oklahoma City with my mother and my father and with my brother and my sister. It isn't unusual how we recall certain things that happened to us when we were quite young. And I remember this conversation that I had with my father one night. <clears throat> my father was, was a man who did not put a premium on education at all. As a matter of fact, I'm the only person in my family that ever went to college. Uh, and I have three degrees, all of them with highest honors. I worked really hard, but I got absolutely no support at all from my family. And my father told me, he said, Cameron, you don't need to go to school. It's not important. And when you get older, you can just lie to people and tell them that you went to high school. And uh, they'll never know the difference. It's just not important for you to get an education at all. And he meant that. And even though I was just a little young child, I, there was something intuitively within me that said, well, that isn't right. That isn't making sense to me. I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't believe it. I was very disappointed in my father because of his position in, in, in that regard. And uh, notwithstanding my, my lack of support from my family, I had a drive from inside. I don't know where it came from, but I got it. Still have it. I'm still going to school now, as a matter of fact. And uh, I love to learn. Um, and I've, made, I've spent my life learning. And I'm still learning. And I'll be learning until the day I die. I <clears throat> took a course here about two years ago from Dale Carnegie. I really enjoyed it after I graduated from the course. I was one of the Carnegie teachers. And I, they call us graduate assistants. And I helped teach the Carnegie courses. And one of the things that I learned in Dale Carnegie was that before you could ever make a speech on any subject, you have to earn the right. And if you haven't earned the right, then don't talk about it. Because people know whether you know what you're talking about when you're speaking. And I'm going to talk tonight about education a little bit. And I've earned the right. I've earned it. I'm an educated person. And I'm proud of that. I'm glad that I have my education. It, and it is the key. It opens many doors, has opened many doors for me, and will in the future. And you young students, I hope that you will listen to me and take heart to what I'm saying and thank the good Lord that you've got parents that love you and are here with you tonight and support you and want you to get that education that you so desperately need to compete in this very competitive world in which we live. <clears throat> When we talk about education and knowledge, and people talk and use the word knowledge, they, they use it almost synonymously with wisdom. But they're two very different things. And I've known people in my life, and you have too, or you will, who were very wise, but uneducated, and didn't really get that much of a formal education, but yet they were very wise people. And they were very successful people. It's far easier to be successful, however, if you've got that, that wisdom and the knowledge coupled together. I know a lawyer in Fort Worth who probably is retired now, but I remember years ago when I used to practice law in Fort Worth. His name is Roland Hill. And uh, Roland uh, almost failed law school. He just wasn't a good student. He had to take the bar examination three times before he was able to practice law. But when you talk to Roland Hill, he was the kind of guy that never talked over your head. You always understood him. He had a lot of common sense. And because of his experiences in life, he had a lot of wisdom. And so he took that wisdom that he had and he coupled it with the knowledge that he acquired in school. And even though he wasn't that good of a student, he took that wisdom and that knowledge, and together he took those two things and turned himself into an extremely successful trial lawyer. One of the most successful trial lawyers, the words they're using, but what they're really trying to say. And that's a, a quality that's difficult for many of us to acquire. As a judge, I'm constantly having to tell people, please stop talking on top of each other. Everybody wants to talk to me at once. You try to listen to two people, you have to try to listen to four or five. And uh, sometimes I've even had to threaten people with contempt and put them in jail. But the ability to listen, listen to others, and listen to what they're really trying to tell you, and you take that and you'll become 
a wise person, and you couple that with the knowledge that you acquire in school, and you'll be a successful person. At any rate, uh, financially, he's a billionaire. He's a very wealthy man. And I watched that interview because I wanted to see what makes Donald Trump tick. It was interesting to me. And a number of questions were presented to him about success, happiness, money, life, some of the philosophical things. But one of the things that I remember that he said in the interview that impressed me the most when he was talking about the, the uh, criteria that he goes by when he determines whether or not he wants to hire someone for a job. This is something many of you would want to need to be thinking about here before too much longer. And he made the comment on the, in the interview that when he decides that he wants to hire someone to go to work for him, he's not interested in brains nearly as much as he is in drive. He said, I want people that are excited about what they want to do. They've got, they've got enthusiasm, they've got drive, they've got spirit. And let's face it, folks, you can have all the knowledge and wisdom in the world, but if you haven't got any drive, if you haven't got any enthusiasm, if you're not fired up about what you want to do, you're not going to get that far. You're just not going to get there. In 1970, I went to Texas Christian University, and I worked on my master's degree in phenomenology and, uh, and in the philosophy of religion. And while I was there, and since I had graduated my, on my master's degree with, with high honors, I, I was a student, but I was also a professor. And I taught in the philosophy department there. And I don't remember a whole lot about my experiences there because it's been, he had a, a wonderful wife that was devoted to him. She came with him to every one of his classes and had a little machine that she would talk into. And she would dictate all of my lectures into that machine and then transcribe them back out into Braille. And he would read them with his fingers at night. And then she would read to him at night and do his homework and his studies. He was an excellent student. He, he graduated with straight A's with a master's degree in philosophy. And he is now a professor at the University of Coral Gables in Florida. He's been successful. Why? Because he had knowledge, but because he had drive, he had spirit. He wasn't going to let his blindness get him down. He was determined to make something out of himself. And he did. Because he had the drive. He had the enthusiasm. He had the spirit. He's the kind of person when you're around that you just can't help seeing a glow and feeling excited about being around that person because you just know that they're going to do something good and something productive with their life. And he sticks in my mind because of the way he was. Well, so I've talked about knowledge coupled with wisdom and drive and enthusiasm and desire. And then we come to the, to the main thing, and that is that you've got to be a dreamer. You've got to have goals. You've heard about the ship that leaves, leaves and for the port that doesn't know where it's going, where does it end up? Nowhere. You've got to be a dreamer. You've got to have goals. If you don't want to do something, then you're not going to do anything. I've had a lot of goals in my life, and I encourage people to change and shift courses and change their, their desires to do what it, whatever it is they want to do with their life as they feel is appropriate under the circumstances. I started out wanting to be a teacher, and I was one. And then I wanted to be a minister, and I was one for a number of years. And then I wanted to be a lawyer, and I was one. I practiced law. And then I wanted to be a judge, and I am one. But what I really want to do, and I'm going to do, I want to be a radio disjunct. <laughs> and I'm going to be one, OK? I don't know when, but I'm going to work it out. Oh, that sounds a little strange, but that's, that's my, my dream. That's my goal. I want to have my own radio talk show. I love to watch Larry King live on TV. And uh, that is something that I dream about doing in my life, is having my own radio show and being a disc jockey. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm proud of that. That's what I want to do. I don't know what you want to do with your life, but I hope that you want to do something. Because if you don't want to do anything, you're not going to do anything. You know, one of the things that I do a lot, and I've done for many years, is I work in the refugee camps down in Central America, 
primarily in El Salvador. I've been going down there for years. I've been to El Salvador three times this year already. And I work in the orphanages down there, and I work in the refugee camps. Um, and I'm a resident of that country. Um, and I love it down there. My wife thinks I'm crazy, and she won't go with me, I don't blame her. But I go down there because it brings me back to the reality of, of what life is really all about. And it helps me to appreciate so much what I have here. One of the villages that I work in, the name of the village is Estensuela. And on the Pan American Highway going out of the capital, San Salvador, into Estensuela, you always go through a bus stop. The name of the, of, the, of the bus stop is Mercedes. And when you get into Mercedes, that's the same as a car. Uh, and I always travel the way everybody else travels. I don't go down here and fat cat it around, drive around big cars. I don't have any anyway. I ride a bus. I just get on the bus with everybody else. Well, it's quite an experience to travel in Central America, particularly in El Salvador, especially out around that area, down that Pan American Highway, because you'll get it for our daily bread. They mean for that day. And in my last trip when I was down to Mercedes, there was a young boy who got on the bus at Mercedes, and we were going back to San Salvador, and he was blind, and I'd seen him before. And he has his job is he's got a flashlight. It's a metal flashlight. And you know how those old time flashlights that have the kind of the ribs on them. He took the batteries out of it. He took the, the light out of the end of it. And he holds the flashlight in one hand and he takes his comb in the other hand and he rakes that comb on that flashlight and makes it into a musical instrument. And he walks up and down the bus, raking his comb on that flashlight and singing. And he's got a beautiful voice. And he walks from one end of the bus for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then when he finishes his songs, he goes down the bus with his hand out begging for money, for colonies. And people will give him a few colonies. And then he punches the bus driver, the driver knows, to let him off. And he gets off and he catches another bus. He does the same thing. He does this every day, all day, back and forth, uh, playing with that old flashlight and that comb, raking that comb on that flashlight and singing to make a living. And that's how he survives. Folks, those are people who can't dream. All they know is disease and poverty and death. That's all they have to look forward to. They don't, they don't put to a school. They don't get an education. And they can't break out of those chains of poverty. And El Salvador is not unlike many other third world countries. It's like that in other countries as well. But uh, I think about that and I watch that and I see that when I go down to Central America. And it makes me, it makes me hurt inside that these children cannot dream. They cannot set goals, set your goals. If you don't make your dreams, you're not going to get anywhere. And you're going to end up like those folks in those third world countries who don't have a chance. You've got a chance. Take advantage of it. And dream those dreams. You're limited only by your own mind as to what you want to do with your life. I had a young lady who came over to my house. Some of you may know her. Her name is Allison Spencer. She works in my teen court. She's one of my attorneys that works in my teen court. And Allison was doing a uh, project for her school, and, and the project was for her to come over and interview me and talk to me about uh, a number of different subjects. I don't remember really now what, what she started off on, but anyway, uh, she came over one night about, about a month ago, and I got to talking with her as I do with the young people, and I tried to encourage her. And uh, we were talking uh, philosophical matters. But the bottom line on that interview is, is that I had a captive audience with her, and she's a delightful young lady, very good student. And I told her, I said, Alice, I just want you to make a difference. Make a difference with your life. Do something with your life that will make a difference. If you, if you don't listen to anything that I've said here tonight, listen to the fact that you can make a difference. You can make a difference. You can do it. And if you think about it long enough, and you think about it hard enough, and you dream enough, and you've got that ambition, enthusiasm, the drive, the spirit, the knowledge, coupled with wisdom, you can make a difference. And that's my message to you tonight, the same as I gave to Alice. Do something to make a difference with your life. You can do that. What do you need? I've told you. Some knowledge some wisdom, a lot of energy to 
drive and a dream. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to dream and to make those dreams come true. Thank you for letting me talk to you.
one thing I feel like that we, and I, I look at Mr. Jackson down there, and I keep saying that we have the best school in Grand Prairie. <laughs> Thank you. 